Okay. So, uh, today we're, we're uh, well, first of all, welcome, scribes, to, to the Canuckonomicon. Episode 5. Episode 5. This is probably uh, more dedicated to a project like this than I have been in my entire life. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't think I've ever finished five chapters of a novel, for instance. That is not entirely true. There were some novels that you quite enjoyed and read thoroughly. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, in writing. writing. <laughs> oh. I completed a whole novel. It was total crap, though. I doubt it was. I'm sure it was fine. Mm. Sounded interesting from what you described. I'll send it home to you. You can read it. All 400 pages. What if I read it and go, this is the greatest work of fiction ever produced? I will weep. <laughs> a single tear. A single tear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're, yeah, we're here at the Canuckonomicon. I'm Junior. I'm Dirty Clyde. Um, so last episode, the sound was not great. We're aware of that. We're trying something new today. Welcome, joining us on this wonderful podcasting journey. Um, there is a, somebody wrote that your first podcast will be awful. Your first novel will be awful. Your first song will be awful, but you got to go out there and make it anyways. That's right. If you don't, then you will never made the awful one yeah. right, by which you compare all others. Yeah. So, this is my first podcast. <laughs> Not my first episode. We're up at episode five, with, like I said, which is a pretty big moment. This is part one of a two-parter. That's right. This is going to be a two-parter, guys. Today, uh, well, first of all, we're drinking um, Ungava Inuit Gin uh, and also Big Rock Honey Brown Amber Lager. Courtesy of Big Rock Brewery. Well, not courtesy. Not of. courtesy. They're not sponsoring us at all, but that would be so cool. I would love if Big Rock sponsored us. If we could have Big Rock sponsors or... of Canuckonomicon. Yeah, there you go. For all 10 of our listeners. <laughs> Tell your friends. <laughs> That's right. Let's make the next episode yeah. a bring a friend. There you go. Episode. I've got people who would love to come on. Really? You've got friends that want to be on our yeah podcast? At least okay. one. Well, they wear deodorant because oh, yes. it's essential you smell pretty good down here. <laughs> Especially you with the get, screen set up. The screen set up makes it a little close. Yeah, he'll just smell like the bush. He's a bushman. So. Oh, okay. That. I get it. <laughs> um, so today we're discussing, well, for our two-parter, we're discussing a place called the Nahani Valley in the Northwest Territories. It's an isolated valley about 500 clicks west of Yellowknife. It's home of the Nahadehe, or the Naha River. The name means River of the Land of the Naha People, and is a Dene name. In the 1940s and 50s, many authors and journalists began to explore the region in the wake of the Second World War, and many myths, legends, and stories of the valley gained international fame as a result. Um... According to the book Legends of the Naha Valley, which is going to be our primary source for this episode, um, by author Hammerson Peters. Two Hammerson? Last, Hammerson Peters. Two last names. Oh, his last name is Hammerson Peters. No, his first name is Hammerson. His last name is Peters. He's got a last name for a first name. <laughs> oh, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> you could have that. Um, <laughs> I'm Smith Smith. I'm Smith Smith. We knew a guy named Clark Clark. Oh, did we? Yeah. No, you. I, I yeah. in the university, your mom and I knew a guy named Clark. Clark. Oh, there you go. He was a ginger as well, so we had <laughs> it all going against him. <laughs> fine, fine teacher, I'm sure he turned out to be. <laughs> um, many of the legends and stories about the region have their origins first with the First Nations people who live in the region, especially the various Dene tribes which then became modified and expanded by a corpus of prospector stories through the 20s and 30s. Canadian historian Pete, uh, Pierre Burton said one of these stories, namely the one we're going to be talking the most about today and which we refer to as the Legend of the Headless Valley, is or was one of the few pieces of bona fide folklore in Canada. The name Headless Valley and the legend of which Burton is speaking Concerns the brutal murder and beheading of two prospectors known as Frank and Willie McLeod. Many of the myths that come out of the valley tie in to these deaths. Ooh, scary kids. 
Yeah. Yeah, you can all, you can you can feel the shivers. <laughs> now, okay. Um just for my edification, is this a creature feature? Is this alien encounter or is this conspiracy theory? No. Yeah, honestly, this particular story is kind of none of those. Oh. This is a folklore prospector story. Like, there's nothing better than a Canadian folklore prospector story. Yeah. The the shooting of Dan McGrew or da- Dangerous Dan McGee, the whatever those are. Yeah, the cremation he, of Sam McGee. The cremation of Sam McGee. You've yes. got you've got the um, another one that comes out of the Nahani Valley is the mad uh, the mad trapper of Rat Creek. Rat River, Rat River Trapper. Yeah, the Rat yeah, River Albert Trapper. Albert Johnson. Albert Johnson. Awesome story. So that one also comes out of the Nahani Valley. True story. True story. So is this one. Um, so the story starts with a man named Fred McLeod, a factor at Liard Fort in McKenzie, on the Mackenzie. After two encounters with Nahani tribesmen bringing in nuggets of gold to purchase goods, he contacted his brother Willie in Edmonton. Willie left immediately, meeting with her other brother, Frank, in British Columbia. Together, Frank and Willie made their way to Fort Liard and met Fred. Fred stayed behind, but Frank and Willie went up the Liard River into the Nahani Valley and spent some time there prospecting for gold. They had a great deal of success, uh, of success on that first trip, finding a fair amount of gold in the rivers there, and then promptly lost most of it gambling. That's pretty typical of the yeah. prospector stories, yeah. Yeah. They had some of the uh, bean-sized nuggets that were left behind from their gambling endeavors um, worked into a watch train, which they give, gave to their older brother, Fred, who was the factor at, at uh, Fort Liard there, which is on the Liard River. Mm-hmm. You're spilling beer all over yourself there, buddy. I'm uh, Mr. Spilly Pants. Mr. Spilly Pants. <laughs> So the following year, Frank and Willie contacted their younger brother, Charlie, and the three went back up to the Nahani, uh, back up into the Nahani again, looking for more gold. Most of their family now lived in Edmonton, and from there they began their trek up north along a rather circuitous route, having taken a train into west, Van- west to Vancouver, a steamer up north, and from there a dog sled back inland, leaving in fall and not reaching their destination until spring. So they right tra- through the winter. Right, they're traveling right through the winter across the mountains at the worst time of the year. Twice. <laughs> you gotta shake your head sometimes. Because, <laughs> because, like I said, this is this place is you know just, way out. There. It's it's but it's near Yellow. It's five hundred clicks to Yellowknife. So about, um, and it, you could just go north from Edmonton. You don't have to go west. Either way, right? There Either were no way. paved roads at that time. No, but even at this time, most people are like, "Why didn't you guys just go north from Edmonton?" That's why it's we call it K days, Klondike days, is because yeah. the Klondikers used to come up here. We were Edmonton at one time was called the gateway to the north. No, we still are, because there's no city of our size this far north in so, North America. <laughs> no, no, and uh, well, aren't we the northernmost major city? Yeah, I think so, but like I always get told we're not, so I don't know. Well, they're counting all those kooky Russian cities that are like <laughs> like apartment blocks. Upon, yeah. Upon apartment block, upon apartment block. Yeah, those are ghost cities. Yeah, a lot of them are yeah. now. Yeah. Totally abandoned. So they, 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 they went along the Flat River and met a mixed band of First Nations people consisting of Slavey, Casca, and Nahani. Or at least they refer to them as Nahani. We'll get to this a little bit later, but there's a lot of debate as to who the Nahani people were. Um, They were a Dene tribe, we know that. So to give you guys an idea, we tend to think of the Northwest Territories and the Arctic as being inhabited by entirely Inuit. That's not actually the case. If you go to kind of below the tree line, anything that's like below the tree line, is probably not going to be Inuit. No, it would be mixed. Mostly Dene. Yeah. The Dene are kind of the subarctic peoples, um, and they live like in northern Alberta and the prairie provinces. Most of the Yukon is Dene. Now, are they Cree speakers or Dene speakers? They speak Dene. Okay. So they're a separate group from the Cree, 
which we also have down here. Yeah. Um, in fact, we're a little bit south for the Dene. Yeah. The Dene are going to be mostly up towards the like, Grand Prairie. Yeah, Fort McMurray. Fort McMurray area. Um, that's where you're going to start seeing Dene. Mm-hmm. So they live a little further north, and they're a uh, distinct culture from the Cree and from the Inuit. Um, but Lesser and Greater Slave Lake are named for the Slavey Dene. Um, so the Slavey that they're talking about in there. Yeah, that's right. So we're talking uh, Slavey, Casca. Um, there were some other groups here. Oh, and Nahani. Among these number was a Nahani subchief named Big Charlie, a Yukon native named Bobby Babich, which, you have an idea, Babich is like rawhide. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Bobby Babich, who had married a Nahani woman, a prospector named Diamond C, as in his name was Diamond, and then the letter C, <laughs> <laughs> and two Nahani named Captain and Iron. Um, this ragtape group was uh, panning for gold, much like the brothers, and the brothers were already familiar with them. They had met before. Um, the First Nations people had found a considerable amount of gold already, and while they were tight-lipped, as all prospectors are, um, about where the brothers, about where they found the gold, the brothers suspected it was somewhere nearby. Um, sure enough, they found a fertile creek bed and spent the better part of the summer panning there getting a fair amount of gold themselves before deciding to head back to Fort Liard to restock um, and then return in the spring. It was already late fall and the brothers didn't want to be stuck in the valley for the winter because, like I said, this is quite far north. It's it's really funny, though, because they (laughs) traveled through the mountains in the winter. (laughs) Yeah, well, and these guys are are noted uh, by others to be experienced woodsmen. Like, they they know the region pretty well. Yeah, so they could survive a winter there, but why? Yeah, exactly. And then that's the other thing is like, uh, and that actually will come up. There's a, this is why it takes people so long to go out looking for them is because they just figured they got stuck for the winter and we're just, <laughs> you know, building a cabin or whatever and we're safe. But on their way back, their makeshift raft, capsi- raft capsized and was lost along with most of their supplies and much of the gold they had recovered. They did make it back to the fort, but they were malnourished and almost completely broke with only a single small file of gold left. They got jobs with the uh, Hudson's Bay Company, working out of Fort Simpson to keep themselves fed. Their terrible gambling habit was well known to most of the folks there, so no company was willing to outfit them on credit for fear of never getting paid back. Robert Weir now comes into our story. He was a Scottish steamboat engineer. Um, he was coming into Fort Liard with a delivery of supplies. He met with Fred McLeod, who was still the Fort Factor at the time at Fort Liard, and during the meeting noticed uh, Fred's gold watch chain. Fred explained that his brothers had made it from the Nahani gold and were in need of supplies for another expedition. Robert, uh, Robert Weir broke his contract with the HBC and instead went to meet Willie and Frank. He agreed to outfit them on the condition that they take him on their next expedition. Willie and Frank agreed. Charlie stayed behind this year. And so Frank and Willie McLeod went with Robert Weir back into the Nahani Valley. And none of them returned. Hmm. So now we're getting to the actual prospector story here. <laughs> so well, so far it's a typical prospector story. You make some money, lose it. Go home, get your brothers. Make some money, yeah. lose it. Yeah. Find a stranger, head into the wilderness. Yep. Yeah.
At first, uh, their older brother, Fred, the factor at Fort Liard, was unconcerned. His brothers were seasoned outdoorsmen and could take care of themselves. However, in 1907, a canoe similar to the one that had brought them was found in a pile of driftwood along the South Nahani River. News spread quickly to Fred, who, was inform- who informed his family back in Edmonton of the disturbing find. Charlie McLeod was determined to find out what had happened to his brothers and made his way into the valley. He brought with him yet another McLeod brother, Danny, along with Sergeant Joy of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police and two brothers of the Lafferty family. They went up to the South Nahani in May of 1908. They found a dog sled with the words, We have found a fine prospect carved into it, but no other clues. Going further upriver, they found two skeletons. Both were adult men, their heads missing. One was reaching for a rifle twisted in its blanket. The other looked as though he had died before even waking up. Charlie looked over the clothing and gear nearby and determined that these were indeed his brothers. Most of their supplies, aside from the picks and shovels, were still there, along with boxes containing gold-bearing quartz, indicating the brothers had found more than just riverbed gold. They had found a vein somewhere up in the mountains. And someone chopped their heads off and didn't take the stuff. Yeah. Mysterious. Yep. However, Robert Weir and the brothers' heads were all missing. The initial investigation by the Northwest Mounted Police surmised that Robert Weir had gone mad after the gold discovery and killed the brothers in order to claim the gold for himself. It seemed a fairly simple case. The following year, however, some slavey Dene found a third unidentified skeleton three miles south of where the McLeod brothers had been found in what was now known as the Deadman Valley. The current theory was that undersupplied, the brothers and their financier had perished from starvation because it was noted that they did not actually bring enough supplies with them on the trip to last the entire season they were planning to be out there. And their heads just fell off. Apparently. <laughs> when you starve, that happens up in, uh, up the, in Dene country. That's Your right. Your head just falls right off. That's right. I was and, so hungry, and that's my head fell off. Yeah, and that's the problem. The fact that these two brothers were found next to each other were known to be superior woodsmen and apparently died nearly at the same time, stated otherwise, that it was very unlikely that they just starved to death out there. And that would also bring up the question of what exactly happened to their heads, because that's not the part that scavengers go after first. They go after your guts first. Were their heads removed after they died for some reason? Charlie McLeod suspected that they had been shot and the heads were moved and dropped into the South Nahani to conceal evidence of bullet wounds. As likely a theory as any, was the third skeleton Robert Weir then, and had he gone mad as the police suspected? Charlie McLeod wasn't convinced, and he went to his deathbed believing that Robert Weir was still alive. According to a numerous prospector story, Charlie actually found Robert Weir and killed him. Okay. Um, and, and I say numerous, there are like six different versions of this story of how Charlie finds Robert Weir. He tracks him down, finds him and asks him what happened to my brothers. And he confesses to murdering them and Charlie kills him. A little bit of trail justice. Yeah. But then who's the third skeleton? (laughs) Precisely. So, so there were the, only the two of them and, and a third separate skeleton three miles away. And they didn't have a Denny group with them this time, or... No, they so didn't. just the three. Just the three, yeah, that's right. Um, so, okay, and this is where we get to a little bit of weird stuff here. Okay, here we go. One of the main culprits of the murders are a First Nation group referred to as the Nahani. So we've discussed them before. The brothers were acquainted with a few members of the Nahani tribes that were in the region. Um, and they're a kind of a mysterious Dene group. And it was Nahani tribesmen who initially kind of initiated this whole prospecting journey of these brothers. It was the two Nahani tribesmen who came in with like full size gold nuggets to buy supplies because they knew white men like their shinies. And so they came in and, and had big chunks of it. Had big chunks of it, like big, fairly, like decently sized uh, nuggets. Um, 
they had a fairly fearsome reputation among the other tribes. They were one of three tribes that lived in the er area, according to Alexander Mackenzie's accounts. There was the Dahotina, the Umbahotin, and the Nahani. The Nahani were also part of a larger Dene group, as were their two sister tribes. Both the Dahotin and the Umbahotin, uh, Umbahotin were actually members of the same tribe, as the Hudson Bay Company learned over time, and had different names only because of the territory they inhabited. One group basically inhabited deer land, and one group inhabited um, mountain goat territory. Okay. And so they were kind of called themselves after which of the two lands they lived in, but they considered themselves to be part of a single larger tribe. Um, <clears throat> so they might have summer camps together. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, there was another group, uh, and, it, and I should point out that this tribe considers the Nahani to be enemies. Um, as well as the Slavey tribe who live along the Mackenzie River, um, and give their names both the Greater and Lesser Slave Lake, they also considered the Nahani to be an enemy tribe. Um, they apparently relayed that they believed the Nahani to be a race of giants, cursed by the spirits for their unnatural practices, including cannibalism. Despite this fearsome reputation, the two expeditions sent out by the HBC to the Nahani met with success and led to a loose relationship between the company and the Nahani tribes. And by loose, I mean the Nahani were never as into, like, buying white men's supplies. So, like, you would more frequently see a Nahani with a bow than you would with a rifle. So they were traditionalists, so to speak. Yeah, they were, they were isolationists. They liked to hide up in the mountains. Interesting. I mean, uh, you have these two uh, First Nations groups mm -hmm. um, uh, saying that these guys are fearsome, warlike yeah. giants, yeah. which leads me to believe they've never encountered them. Well, Other than maybe as part of a... Yeah. As part of a loose group, like uh, an expedition. And, and they did dress differently than the other natives mm -hmm. in the region. Like, this is one thing that was noted when I was reading um, Fred McLeod's account of when the, the two uh, Nahanis came in with the gold, is they were, they had a considerably, not primitive, but kind of a more rough dress mm -hmm. than what the slavey would have, for instance. And so they were easily marked out. They tended to dress a lot more traditionally. Then the slavey did, whereas the slavey would, you know, adopt a bit of... They'd throw a blanket on, a Hudson blanket or whatever they yeah. could to make themselves warmer, more comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have Raymond M. Patterson, who uh, recounted his early 20th century exploration of the South Nahani River in his book, Dangerous River. Described, he described the Nahani as wild mountain men, who, according to prospector stories, were, heard, were hoarding all the gold. Um, until the, uh, the, yeah. So they were hoarding all the gold so that the prospectors couldn't find any in the Nahani Valley. <laughs> <laughs> um, they did live in the valley right up until the, uh, 20th century, but were seldom seen by outsiders as they very infrequently visited trading posts. Um, and after this whole incident with the McLeod brothers and them being kind of accused of it, they became even more isolationist hiding even further out into the mountains where they couldn't be found. Um, by the time Patterson was exploring the Nahani River, the tribes had been reduced, as most who contacted Europeans were, by disease to a very small number, and were working mostly as trappers, and were now at this point heavily reliant on the Hudson Bay Company for necessities. Patterson did encounter a band of them on his own trip, and his encounter involved much more exchanging of tea and pleasantries. He has a whole incident he describes where they, would, they came in to his camp, kind of uninvited, came into his house, and just sat down, and so he served them some tea. They had a Yukon native with them who translated. He was a, I think he was Métis, mm -hmm. and he translated for, uh, for Patterson, and that's... Pretty much all they were saying was that's a lot of tea because they made them like a big pot of tea. <laughs> they they just never seen that much tea before. <laughs> wow! And as they left, he's like, "Okay, well that was weird," and they just dumped a bunch of moose meat on top of his cabin. Wow! For him to take <laughs> before riding off. 
Well, and that seems like the most believable of the stories. Yeah. Well, and and, and at this point, like uh, he found out later, I think this group they they succumbed, like the rest of the tribe, to a plague of influenza that blew through the tribe and just wiped them out. Which is part of why there's a big mystery as to what they were actually called, because there's none left. Right. There's no one to ask, and the Dene, uh, the other Dene tribes, all just called them the Nahani, which from various interpretations could mean anything from the mountain men to those other guys over there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're, they're a mysterious and uh, what, what do you want to call xenophobic group? Yeah. Um, the bloodthirsty reputation of the tribe that lived in the Nahani Valley, the true name of which, like I've said, there's some debate about, likely came from the fact that the Nahani were frequent enemies and raiders of the tribes in the surrounding lands. The Slavey certainly seemed to be victims of their assaults, and while the Dene tribes along the Mackenzie and South Nahani rivers didn't have quite the history of warfare that other tribes like the Inuit and the Cree have, um, they weren't strangers to warfare. This was not outside their ex- like their their kind of broader concept of how you live life. So any ideas that this was like a peaceful free love group no no they still fought each other from mm-hmm. time to time mm-hmm. but um the dene were kind of just generally known to be a little less aggressive than say the inuit or the cree right um and whether the non-extinct nahani were more prone to violence or not still remains a mystery though neighboring tribes such as the west coast Tlingit were were known to practice headhunting. Um, and so there's this somewhat of an idea that the Nahani might have been headhunters. It would come out, and that's what happened to the McLeod brothers, is the Nahani claimed their heads. But that's not a Dene tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a thing the Dene ever did. The Dene would occasionally scalp. Um, and as far as we can tell, the brothers weren't scalped, unless their heads were removed and then scalped later. Which makes no sense. Well, there were, again, there were tribes that did that, well, but it was... The idea of scalping was to keep a trophy, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, like, we don't know. Um, and it is also possible that the uh, Slavey Dene stories of the Nahani being, are being conflated with another set of Dene legends concerning a Stone Age group known as the Naha, who, according to Dene oral tradition once lived in these mountains. Unlike the Nahani, who simply forewent things like HBC muskets out of choice, the Naha were described as being a truly primitive, almost um, troglodytic group. Almost every story concerning the Naha by the Dene uh, focuses on their brutal and primitive state of their like very rough tools and very rough clothing. Um, leading some to think that they might have been troglodytes or cavemen of some kind. And there are caves up in the Nahani Valley that do seem to have some sign of being inhabited at some point. Um, and so the theory is that these, these Naha people lived up in these caves. Um, it is said they would conduct vicious raids against the Dene. And one day, after a series of particularly brutal raids, a Dene war party went into the valley to seek revenge. However, they embarked on this trip only to find that the Naha had completely disappeared, leaving behind only their tents and a few meager supplies, and no sign of what became of them. Some suspect that these Naha might have migrated south, becoming the Navajo of today. And this theory comes from the fact that the Naha or the Navajo and the Dene languages are related. Okay. So this idea that the Navajo are a uh, direct descendant of the Nahani or of the Naha kind of comes from this linguistic evaluation, but archeologically there's really not much sign of that. There's not a lot culturally similar between the two groups. Mm-hmm. Um, the few kind of like story similarities seem like they could have just as easily been traded through trade lines. Yeah. It, it... <laughs> It's a big stretch to say to go from primitive, quote unquote, troglodytes yeah. to being Navajo, yeah, which was a a highly centralized 
civilization. Yeah, and so while that is a theory, sure, it's compelling. I don't think the Naha became the Navajo. About the only, like, so... Here's the question, could they have become the Nahani? Well, and that is, that's a much more compelling question. Could they have become the... It's possible. Um, like I said, we don't really know anything about the Nahani history because they were wiped out by influenza. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and that's assuming that even at that point that there were any, um, like, story keepers left among them. Right. Or if they had just slowly started becoming completely assimilated by the HBC and the other surrounding more powerful Dene tribes. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So we don't have beyond this oral story of this tribe living up in this region. We don't have a whole lot of strong evidence suggesting they were there. Right. Um, And probably there's no archeological record. Yeah. And, and problematically for our particular investigation into the McLeod brothers is they were gone. By this point, um, even the stories say that they were gone by this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and the stories long predate any white men being in the area. Um, so could it have been the Nahani that killed the McLeod brothers? Well, I would posit, why would they? <laughs> Since they'd been friendly up till that time. Yeah, and, and it's not like the, the McLeods were unfamiliar with the Nahani. They'd traded with them before, obviously. They had friends among the tribe um and the mcclouds don't really seem to be all that overly concerned with getting in the way of first nations groups mm-hmm. um and the, the mcclouds are actually metis that's another thing i don't really mention it much because it doesn't really come up much but mm-hmm. from what i i've read the mcclouds were a metis family so they weren't totally disconnected from that world either right now more likely they would have been cree given that they lived in edmonton um, only the one brother lived in the region. Right. Um, the rest seemed to live either in British Columbia or Edmonton. And that suggests to me that they, and, and the last name being McLeod, suggests to me they're probably Cree descended Metis, or maybe even just Metis Metis. <laughs> yeah. Um, they definitely weren't French Metis. They're McLeods. Right. So. <clears throat> um, other theories for the mysterious beheadings including, include the concept that the valley is cursed. Um, and others think it might have even been, like we kind of mentioned earlier, the mad trapper of Rat, Rat River. Um, because he was in the region at this time. Yeah, I don't think he was really well known for beheading. Well, he was not really well known for anything. No. <laughs> he was a mysterious mad trapper, and... Uh, The theory goes that a a lot of the disappearances and murders that occurred in the valley were because of him. Because he was just this mad trapper up in the valley hiding out. So to give you guys a bit of background on the mad trapper, this guy who supposedly was named Albert Johnston, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Albert Johnson. um, He lived up in the valley and... uh, couple RCMP came to him because he'd been accused of springing traps. Um, and he wouldn't answer his door, so they brought back a larger force, and he ki- well, he didn't kill, but he shot one of the RCMP officers and then fled, leading to one of the biggest manhunts in Canadian history. They tracked this guy for weeks across dangerous territory. Yeah, it was front-page news on yeah. every newspaper. Before finally taking him down in a hail of bullets yeah and there's uh pictures they're death pictures of albert johnson yeah he took seven shots to kill him there wasn't much left of the guy by the time they no finally took him down no it was a uh, bush pilot um uh Wap may is the one who actually finally determined that he was dead mm-hmm. um because he came down he was tracking him by plane for them and then Wap may actually came down kind of skimmed his skis along the snow and went by him and noticed that he was laying flat on his stomach, his head in the snow, yeah. and his hand off his gun. And uh, that's when he, he realized that they had successfully killed the guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he, uh, Walt May, said the guy had a sneer of intense hatred on his face. Cabin fever. Well, they, they, the yeah. They, that's what they think. Yeah. He might have gone mad, or he might have yeah. um, just been a broken terrible human to begin with we don't know 
And there were so many mysterious deaths and disappearances in this valley, unlike other valleys, that a lot of the RCMP who were on this case suspected he might have been part of it. Um, he might have been killing people out in the woods for sport. Although you, th- you think that would have gotten back. Who knows? <laughs> well, although, yeah, I know I, uh, trappers are a secretive group as it is, but if there's, yeah. a, if there's a lunatic out there, there would have been stories. And there well, were stories that he was springing people's traps and stealing well, their... Well, that was the one thing that, uh, that finally got somebody to go to the RCMP. Um, was that he might have been, he was springing this guy's traps. Um, but as for the other stuff, if you're like a lot of, it's not just that a lot of trappers were secretive, it's that a lot of them were single. Yeah. They didn't have family members who were waiting for them. And, you know, you disappear in the bush. Yeah, nobody dis- notices. Nobody notices. You disappear, yeah. or they notice, but they go, well, it's the bush. What do you want us to do? Mm-hmm. And uh, the Nahani Valley was known particularly for being kind of this cursed dangerous area uh the dene actually said it was full of uh, bad medicine yeah. this was a, this was an area that was known for being cursed and dangerous and inhabited by evil spirits which is why their stories of the nahani tribe would be so conflated so you know exaggerated yeah like, these guys are giants and yeah because they uh, live in the valley they live in the valley and the valley's cursed so the only people that could survive there would have to be giants would have or, to be these super or cursed human yeah creatures and yeah. like I, I, i'm not going to get into this episode but we have so many different kinds of of creatures and people said to live in this valley we have the wahila which is a giant wolf we've got a group called uh, the nakani which are these kind of savage, um, Neanderthal-like wild men. Uh, we've got the Nuklucks, which are like Arctic pygmies. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's all... We have... Uh, the, the prospectors came back with stories of, the, of what they called the Hidden Valley, which was this idea that there's this temperate... Paradise. Paradise in there inhabited by, like, by prehistoric animals. Uh, we have legends of like mammoths and saber toothed cats still living in this valley, which, given how isolated it is, isn't totally crazy. Like the, the Nahani River itself is a killer. Yeah, it's it's, it's one of the white water it's one challenges of, for that's canoeists right. and kayakists. That's kayakers. right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That also came up, and like so, this region is not known for being a it, it, gentle it region. Is hostile. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which. When you think about it, that's where, you know, it gets its reputation for being cursed, etc. Yeah. Because, you know, um, uh, the First Nations people being adept uh, at, at navigating rivers, if they think a river is dangerous. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's not a place you want to be. Yeah. Um, I have an excerpt from uh, Robert or Raymond M. Patterson's uh, Dangerous River here describing... Um, so uh, there were another group that disappeared up here. That's part of what led to this idea of the curse. So there were a number of what we call Klondike stampeders. These are people who are going up to the Klondike searching for gold, and they thought they'd take a shortcut through the Nahani Valley to get to the Klondike. Um, they never left the valley. They made it to the valley, and then after that, we don't really know what happened to them. Um, but years later, explorer Raymond M. Patterson came across the ruins of their ominous cabins. And he uh, wrote, um, there was an eerie, uncanny feel to them that could not be wholly accounted for by the silence of the place. Hidden away up this, up this sign, uh, sny, and removed from all the rush and turmoil of fast water. Or by the dark old trees of their long gray-green streamers of moss that swayed in ghostly fashion at the faintest whisper of a breeze. There was something wrong about these old cabins. Something happened there to the men who built them. And according to a Klondike-era story attributed to Klondiker Jack Stainer, the cabins had also been found earlier, the bunks still occupied by their owners. Three men, frozen stiff in their sleep. The valley had conquered them, just as it had conquered the McLeod brothers. Hmm. (laughs) That's pretty cool. (laughs) The the, uh, the the stories and tales of 
of the life of the Klondikers. Yeah. Is, uh, is fascinating. It has its own folklore. It has its own mythology. It has its own heroes and villains. And it's, 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 it's close to uh, kind of inland Canadian folklore as you really get. Like, you have a lot of stories out on the East Coast ghost ships and stuff but when you come to inland canada so much of it is is such young country yeah it's just settler stories there's just a lot of settler stories um which is fine we showed up here we broke the land we lived hand to mouth for a couple of years committed a couple of genocides you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then things got better and then things got better we built some cities and you know <laughs> so we don't we don't have that much like uh kind of old folklore but if you go up to the klondike area you get yeah. all these like fascinating prospector stories well the interesting the the shape of the human being that is is determined to go up there and create a life yeah create a living to to bring something out of there um has has to be you know a different sort of fiber than yeah. what a settler would have yeah and and especially like uh, like somebody who's going up to a place like the Nahani, which is it just is this dangerous dangerous land, yeah. this dangerous territory. It's it's got to be one. Of, I I I think, in my opinion, it is Canada Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, in terms of how many corpses and how many... How many corpses, how many stories, how many... How many disappearances, many, yeah. The, how many mysterious sightings. Like, we have, like I just said, like three separate kinds of cryptid, inc not including Bigfoot, that are said to inhabit the area. Right. So many fascinating legends coming out of the area. And if you're looking for a place that is kind of Canada Skinwalker Ranch, it'd be the Nahani Valley. Yeah. You want to go somewhere, you're going to see something weird. It's going to be the Nahani Valley. Minus the UFO sightings. Well, yeah. But I mean, uh, apparently, uh, according to everything I can find, all you need to do to see UFOs in Canada is be in Canada. <laughs> oh, is that right? Canada's got like tons of UFO sightings like every year. And it's been getting like more and more since 2012. Just more and more people looking up, <laughs> saying well, things. Not not having looked up before, being surprised at what they see. There's <laughs> a lot of movement up there. Yeah, there is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so Can Canada's actually got quite a reputation as a UFO country. Mm -hmm. um, probably, not. I wouldn't say more so than the United States, but pretty close. Mm -hmm. More spread out. We don't have like a, a a single region that's like a hot spot for UFOs the way the U.S. does. We right. we're just kind of more spread out, even, oh, geez, evenly distributed across the uh, vast nation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like I said, come in, guys, next week. Uh, we'll talk more about the Nahani Valley. We'll talk about the Nukluk, the Nakani, and the Wahila. Mm, so we get into the cryptids next week. We're getting into the cryptids next week. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, that'll be great. That'll yeah. be a good one. Uh, I'm sure you'll find a place to put in a music break in there. <laughs> I'll, I'll try. Uh, it'll be one of the um breaks. In the, <laughs> yeah, that's the right. <laughs> and we're back. I don't know how I'll fit that in. Ah. I might have to move the whole sound bite over, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure work it out. It. We'll figure that's, it out. That's that's the magic of digital technology. <laughs> that's right. So thank you guys. Um, you can check us out on iTunes. Uh, we are on SoundCloud. I will say, I'm not shelling out for a premium SoundCloud account. So not all our episodes are up there because I've got like a limited amount I can put up. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I do have a professional one on. Um, yeah. For, for for my music, but yeah. Yeah, so... <laughs> well, so but, I don't think SoundCloud is a big uh, podcast. No, people anyway. people put them up there so people can find them. But I will say that if you do want to get in touch with us, you can hit us up on Twitter, at the Um You can email us, kanukonomicon at gmail.com. Um, like I said, I'm Junior, this is Dirty Clyde, and we'll catch you guys in the next episode. And uh, be sure to bring your warm booties. Keep your eyes open. <laughs>